like you guys to pay attention to how many young people that we have up here today. Does my heart good? All three of them, um, I got to know in the youth program. And as a parent, I know that there's nothing that would make a parent prouder than to watch you guys. And as, a, as part of the youth program, I think about every day that I got to know you. And I want you to know that he's using each one of you as a tool. And Seth has such a heart for God. All of our kids do. And as a part of the youth program before granddaughter started landing in my life, um, it was wonderful to watch them grow spiritually. Seth is one that we had to learn how to share. And coming from um, a family of five kids, I totally understand the whole hanging the baby doll out the window. I totally get that. And um, I am thankful in my heart to watch you guys continue to grow and to love God the way that you do. Seth, I know without a doubt you are one of God's biggest tools. And that you will succeed in no matter what you do. Amen. I pray for you. I pray for each one of you. And I ask that all of us have our ears open to what our young people have to say because they are our future. Yes. Thank And so I was praying about it, and I was on Facebook, 
um, as most of the people my age are at any given moment. Um, but I was on Facebook and I said, well, who, what am I going to be talking about? What am I going to be doing? Um, I have all these things I have to get used to. I just started working down at Milo. I'm working in the calf most of the time. So I got a big old cut on Sunday. So that was another thing. I'm worrying about all these things and um, just thinking about, man, what does God want me to say? What does God want me to know? Because for me, um, what I'm, what I'm going to be sharing this morning isn't, isn't like me saying, here's my brain. Here's all this knowledge that I've gained. Here's what God has shown me. This is, this is me relating to you as a human who's going, who's, I should be sitting in the pews and the Holy Spirit should just be telepathically communicating with all of us. I hope that's kind of what happens. I just want to be a channel this morning. I don't want to, I don't want to make it seem like I know what I'm talking about and that I'm some big guy. You all, most of you have no reason to tell little anyway, so. Um, Praying about it, I was on Facebook and I was talking to this friend of mine who um, I've known since I was a freshman. She she did a, she graduated at Milo and I've been talking to her. She made a post the other day on Facebook. Um, I thought for a long time I hadn't talked to her for a long time. She made a post about how she rides the bus every morning at 6:25 and she turns off her cell phone and just watches, just looks outside and just she was talking, reflecting about how she just observes God's beauty. You know, even in the city she lives in. in Central California. Um, she she was just talking about looking at the people, looking at the sunrise, looking at the buildings, looking at all the trees. Everything God has made for us, or God has given us the ability to make. All these things that we see around us in the world that people. She looked around the bus and, and said, "All these people who are worried about whether they're going to be at work on time, whether they have the right suit, the right tie, too, the right tie. Um, all these things. Whether they have everything lined up, everything." You know, perfectly organized for their for their life when they're ready to start the day, all these things. Um, and she just got sad. And it was weird for me to read this post because it was really long. And uh, because knowing her, she wasn't really exactly spiritual when she went to Milo. And, and she had, as far as I knew, she wasn't at all after she left. Um, and so I was like, wow, this is very interesting. Um, God is moving. And so I, I commented her on her little thing and was like, oh, hey, praise God. I'm glad that you're finding him. And, in the ways that you know he's guided me to find him, um, and so I, I that was a couple weeks ago, and I asked her on Monday, I think, randomly the spirit was like, ask her what you should talk about, um, and I was like, how is she going to know what I'm supposed to talk about? She doesn't even go to church, I doubt um, anymore, and all these things. I'm just like, what is what? Okay, so I asked her. I said, hey, what do you think my sermon should be about? She logged off immediately after, and I was like, okay, well that's probably a sign um, that I shouldn't have asked her. <laughs> And so I was just like, oh man, so I was thinking, 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 what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Um, and later that night I got on and she was on and she replied and said, you should talk about acceptance. Um, but more than that, you should talk about not judging. And what she was saying is like, not the cheesy kind that you always hear about, you know, adults stop judging the kids because they sack their pants and pierce their ears and have tattoos. Because we've all heard that a million times and we we're over that now, I hope. Um, but she was saying, we, we should talk about um, acceptance on a broader understanding in that um, acceptance in, in the, on the level that I think that our text this morning is reflecting. So I'll bring it back to that right now. I'm, I'm just praying that the Spirit, I, I have a couple pages of things that I copied off the internet, um, and there's a couple Head marks, but really is really unorganized. So, <coughs> Holy Ghost, help me. I hope that you guys get a blessing from today's message. Um, she was saying, let's talk about acceptance. And so I said, okay. Um, I looked up acceptance in the Bible. One of the first verses I came up with, Romans 11, or chapters. Um, and Romans 11, 15 specifically, um, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. It says, for since the Jews' rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, how much more wonderful their acceptance will be. It will be life for those who are dead. So, first thing, I was like, well, what does this verse mean? I am not a huge Bible scholar, and I was just like, oh, I wonder if there's any nuances that we're missing in Greek, because that's typically what people do, I guess, when they do sermons, they look at the Greek, because that's important. And so I was like, yes, Greek. So I typed in on Google, Romans 11.34 in Greek. And I read it, and I was like, well, this says the exact same thing in Greek that it does in English. So 
I, you, you can look at the definitions of the words, and that's where things get interesting, because you look at the word acceptance um, in the Greek, and I am sure I'm going to mispronounce this, but it's in, on the internet, bear with me, on the internet, it says that it's pronounced proslapsis. Um, this word means, comes from um, the idea that it's not just accepting, because for us, a lot of us, it acceptance has become tolerance, where we say, oh, okay, I'll accept you because I have to, because the Bible says I need to accept you. But this is a, an active acceptance. The Bible here in Greek says an active, you know, like a reaching out, like a longing for. It's, it's, it's something that you are wanting, something that you, you need. It's, it's an acceptance, but it's more like fulfillment. It's a fulfilling, fulfilling, like by accepting you, I'm... There's something that you're feeling, and I need to accept you, a need for acceptance. And so, it says, for since the Jews' rejection, blah, 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 their acceptance, you know, this is something that they're longing for. So, what it says that this acceptance will bring is life among the dead. Now, how many of us um, were born into the Adventist church? Yes? Awesome. Doesn't matter if you were or weren't, for the sake of the question. I was just asking to make sure. Um... For me, I know being born into the church, it was like you're born into the culture quicker than you're born into the church. For me, I, didn't, I wasn't really born, I don't consider myself born into the Adventist church until a couple of years ago where I really started experiencing God for myself, finding that spiritual connection, what it means to be fulfilled um, spiritually by God and stuff like that, to really be loved by God. And so, it's, it's, this, is, this is what it's like. I think this is a perfect picture. It's, it's life, it's bringing life to the dead. It's, to me, before I really experienced spirituality and fleshed it out for myself, what it means, I was dead. <laughs> I was walking around and I was making jokes and I was getting along fine and I was raising the church, so I was okay. But, but once you experience it, it's like the old life was like, it was empty. It was like you're a shell of a person and you experience this idea of grace, this idea of, of God's unending love. And so it's, 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 saying it's the contrast between night and day, you know what I mean, sight and blindness. Um, so, let's start at the very beginning of Romans. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation because I really like it. Um, and so we'll start from verse 1 and we'll kind of just read through it and add some context. Context, um, I'll read the, first, the last two verses of chapter 10. So, um, we'll put some context on this. and says, Isaiah spoke boldly for God. I was found by people, this is God speaking, I was found by people who were not looking for me. I showed myself to those who were not asking for me. But regarding Israel, God said, all day long I opened my arms to them, but they kept disobeying me and arguing with me. So this is again written to the Jews. This is specifically tackling the idea of um, seeking for God and not finding him. That's, I think, what I want to focus on because it's easier than we think. So then Romans 11 chapter, Romans chapter 11 verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people, the Jews? Of course not. Remember that I myself am a Jew, a descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Now for the sake of the passage and making it applicable to ourselves, we'll say that Paul is addressing the Adventist church or the Christian church, however you want to put it. Um, he's addressing us. So, verse 2. No. God has not rejected his own people, whom he chose from the very beginning. Do you remember what the scriptures say about this? Elijah the prophet complained to God about the people of Israel and said, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I alone am left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And do you remember God's reply? He said, you are not the only one left. I have 7,000 others who have never bowed down to Baal. It is the same today. It is the same today, for not all Jews have turned away from God. If you are being saved as a result of God's kindness in choosing them. So, this, I have, I've been, um, as I've been getting older and meeting more people, there's a lot of people I'm finding who are very critical of, of church systems and church blah, blah, blah. Um, and to me it's interesting because I've grown up Adventist, like I said, and for me, it's a little disconcerting because these people consider themselves Adventists and they're tearing down on, you know, like the Adventist church. We're falling away from God. They're not following the Bible anymore, all these things. And I'm like, whoa, 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 I'm Adventist. And I, 
not doing it perfectly, but I think I'm doing, I think I'm following the Bible, studying the Bible, trying to figure out what God's will is, going off of what that is. Um, and so this verse is saying, I think this verse is specifically for those people. It says, it is the same today, for not all Adventists have turned away from God. Amen? Amen. Not all of us are completely far gone. This is a good, this is a happy, this is a happy message, by the way. It's, it's a little boring at first because we have to read it, but then we'll get into implications, and that's huge. Um, not all Jews have turned away from God. If you are being saved as a result of God's kindness in choosing that, verse 6, and if they are saved by God's kindness, then it is not by their good works. For in that case, God's wonderful kindness would not be what it really is. Free and undeserved. Now, this is where it gets a little meaty and a little hard to chew and a little hard to swallow, but we're not babies anymore, amen? We are ready. We're done with the milk. We're ready for the meat. So, it's, okay, so it's so much, it's, this is, this is hard for me to even explain because it's something that I'm still processing and understanding. Um, verse 6, it is not by their good, good works, for in that case, God's wonderful kindness would not be what it is, really, free and undeserved. So how many of us have, have become tired going, have, have become, because I have, I have recently, just this last summer, I, I, I was a coal porter, it was my second summer coal portering, and I was, I was getting tired, I was like, why am I doing this, why am I going door to door, I don't even like these people, these people don't really like me, what, what's the purpose? What am I, what is God, I, I was struggling with this idea, and it was, it was a dark time, let me tell you, it was, it was crazy, but I was, why am I doing this, what, what is the purpose for me telling people about the good news of the gospel, if I don't even feel like there's any, any, is it, I, I understand that it's news, I understand that we're telling them something, I don't really know why it's good, though, like, what is, what is the good, what's so good about good news? And so I was, I was understanding, I was, I was struggling, and I was crying out to God, and I was feeling like he wasn't answering me at all, and I was like, wow, I'm just struggling, and I felt like God was giving me an inch and expecting me to make a mile out of it, is what was, quite frankly, the easiest way to put it. I was like, God, you've given me these, this thing, this understanding, and now I'm just, I'm writing on fumes is what I'm doing spiritually. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, excuse, I'm making excuses for myself spiritually. What am I, like, I'm excusing the way that I'm feeling because I know that it's okay some, for some reason. I, it's okay to feel this way because God has led me in the past and God has, you know, done these things. And it, it's just, I was getting tired and I was like, what in the world, what am I doing? What do I have to do to understand that God is really here with me? What? Do I do? I was feeling guilty, very guilty. Like, what, what, what am I doing to cause this disconnect? Um, now, I've been reading this book recently called Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman. And this book has just been blowing my mind and making me think about a lot of important questions. And I want to read a, a, a little passage real quick out of this book called Not a Fan. The passage is called Guilt Over Grace. When following, oh, let's skip down to here. It says, fans who follow the rules instead of following Jesus find that they are weighed down with guilt. Every time they come to church, they find that the preacher has another weight to add to the bar. The key word for fear and guilt is do. We try and do enough to make up for our mistakes and earn God's favor. Instead of following Christ, we are determined to make our own way. The key word, and this is beautiful, the key word for grace is done. Our punishment was taken by Christ. He has made a way where there was no way, so we, oh, I think I made a this right now. He made a way where there was no way, so we could live with a freedom and an appreciation for what has been done. Now this book is about asking the question, are we fans or followers? Are we interested or are we committed? Fans are all about the do, but followers 
celebrate the done. Amen? When was the last time, and I, you don't have to answer, but I mean, when was the last time you threw your hands up spiritually and said, I don't, there's, no, there's nothing more for me to do. It's already been done. It's already been accomplished. There's no more atoning for my sins with works that I have to do. Because that's, that's where I am. That's where I have to daily remind myself. I wake up and say, I need to pray. And I said, I don't need to pray. I want to pray. Because I want to talk with the God who's going to sustain me for the rest of my day. Who's going to help me control my temper. Who's going to make me be on time to work. You know what I mean? When was the last time we started looking at our relationship with Christ instead of our religion to the church? Are you following me here? Yes, thank you, thank you, please. Say something, thank you, thank you. This is good news, folks. This is, this is, the only reason I'm not is because when I get too excited, I don't speak properly. It's, this concept has been blowing my mind that we are justified on total faith. Total faith. Amen? Amen. Thank you. I'm hearing you. Thank you. Okay. Let's continue. Um, verse 7. So, recapping. Not by our good works, but in that case. And, and let me emphasize something real quick also. It is not by our good works. He doesn't just say that it's by our works. So, even when you think you're doing good, pat yourself on the back, but that's not why you're, that's not what you're in it. That's not what you're in it for. Your good works are, you're, they're still good. He doesn't discount them by saying all works are bad. If, you, if you're doing evangelistic work, it's not bad because you're working. It's still good, but it's not the epitome of what you're doing. It shouldn't be why you're doing. You shouldn't be doing your good works for the sake of doing good works. Okay, so on to verse 7. And I love Paul. And I think I just like this translation a lot because it just really helps my mind because I'm hyper-analytical. And so this next chapter recaps basically everything he's been saying, which is what I like. Because I, I like bullet points. Um, verse 7. So this is the situation. This is Paul diagnosing essentially what he's been saying so far. This is the situation. Most of the Jews have not found the favor of God they are looking for so earnestly. Again, how hard have you been working for something you already have? As for me, I grew up in a home where you need to earn what's given to you, where you can't, not where you can't, but you shouldn't take gifts because you don't need charity. Are you following me? Yes? Okay, we have this tendency as humans to say, I don't, you don't need to give me anything, and the reason you're giving me something is because th there's, there's, this obvious, there's this obvious give and take. Everything in our minds, it, it operates around finite, finite ideas, we're finite beings, we like what's familiar, we don't like something that's infinite and inexplainable. So we, we, we look at this idea that... Why is God not showing up if I've been going to church on Saturday, if I've been eating vegetables, if I have been shunning those who eat meat, if I have been slowly weaning myself off of dairy, if I have been reading my Bible for two hours every morning, and studying the Greek and the Hebrew, and I'm getting my, my, my degree in theology. Why is God not here? Where, what am I doing that's wrong? Well, the key, and this again is no big truth. This has been we've been sitting on it. It's one of the it's one of the things. I'm pretty sure it's one of our fundamental beliefs: justification by faith. Um, it's nothing new. It's just in the pace of human life, we get used to schedules, and we get used to not the scheduler bad. Because I like schedules. I'm organized. I like to be organized. It's not that schedules are bad. It's that sometimes they can distract us from what why we're doing. We make schedules so that we can be on time or so that we can we make a schedule so that we can have that extra hour in the evening to spend with our families or that extra half an hour for our favorite TV show or that extra time we need to prepare a meal or the extra time, whatever. That's why we make the schedule. It's not because, you know, I need to be working. Boom, boom, boom. Um, 
So, reading on, they have not found the favor of the God they are looking for so earnestly. That's just so personal to me because this summer, again, I've been, I was searching, 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 going door to door, waiting for God to show up, waiting for Him to make an experience. And there would be good experiences that I would get sets out and I'd get multiple books out of doors and that's nothing to brag about because it didn't happen all the time. And even if it did, it still wouldn't be anything to brag about. Because there was... There was no, there was a disconnect. I was, I was looking so hard for a God's favor that I felt wasn't showing up. So going on in verse seven, a few have the ones God has chosen, but the rest were made unresponsive. Verse eight, as the scriptures say, God has put them into a deep sleep. To this very day, He has shut their eyes so that they do not see, and closed their ears so they do not hear. Now. This is one of the quotes from the Old Testament. There's already been like two or three in this passage already. But this is one of the quotes that I want to go back to. I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 20, 29, verse 4. And this is God talking, renewing His covenant for the X number of times. Who knows? It's, there's too many. That was why. That was one of the reasons I have a hard time reading the Old Testament. Because it's just failure, I'm sorry, let's do it again. Failure, I'm sorry, let's do it again. And I was like, when are these guys going to learn their lesson? But... It's the same way with us. So, um, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 4, God is renewing his covenant with the Israelites, saying, this is a quote from there. He says, he's saying, you know, I have closed your eyes, all these things, they're, they're not responsible. And when we read the story of the Israelites, like I just said, when are these guys going to learn their lesson? When are they going to understand that this is the God who brought them out of Egypt, part of the Red Seas, Kill Pharaoh or kill Pharaoh's armies, and has you know done all these miraculous things, gives them manna, protected them from all these wars, helped them win all these wars. When are they going to learn? Why are they? What are they? What are they looking for? Because it's it boggles my mind that they can't understand something so simple that God has been doing all these things. God has been with them the whole time. What are they looking for? What are they looking for? And then God did this thing to me. And I hate it when he does these things to me because it just, I throw a fit spiritually because I'm like, why? Why does it, why does it have to be this way? Why did you, okay, so let me tell you what he did because um, I'm not making any sense. So I was understanding this thing and I was like, what are they looking for? What are they trying so hard to do that they're missing all these huge things that God is doing? God flipped it on me and said, what are you looking for so hard that you're missing all of these things that I'm doing in your life? I'm leading you to these spiritual conversations. You're seeing the great controversy happen before your eyes every day, whether you know it or not. In the campusing world and in the real world. You living, that's a miracle. Amen? Amen. And I have to sit down because my mind is, uh, operates at such a quick pace. I have to sit down and really just focus on that. That I have been looking out so hard for something that's already in here. Do you understand the disconnect here between our relationship with God and what He, what, where the, where the. You know what I mean? God is already here, but I still don't feel Him. And so I, I look, and I'm not seeing Him, and I'm not seeing Him. And it's God telling me, you're not going to find anything quality by looking out here until you see what I'm doing in here. Amen? You can go years. You can go a lifetime. And I'm sure there are people who have, who have ridden on the fumes of other spiritual experiences. God has no grandchildren, folks. You can't get in because my parents went to church. You can't get in because, oh, I was friends with this guy. Or I influenced him to do that one thing. You can't, you can't even, the, the, the thing that's crazy is you shouldn't even focus on getting in. Because you already are by accepting, by saying, hey, God, I love you and I know you love me. You've already won the golden ticket. You've already done everything that God expects you to do. Now everything else you do, 
should be based around that statement. I'm not saying that works are completely irrelevant to your faith life. Like if you say, God, I love you, and you smoke a cigarette. Well, yeah, we won't go there. But I'm saying God is not so finite in that he has these, yeah, okay, let's go back to the text. I'm joking. <laughs> All right, verse, verse 9. Okay, so for recapping, we're looking so hard for this God that we're not finding, but he's already there. So verse 9 says, David spoke of the same thing when he said, Let their bountiful table become a snare, a trap that makes them think all is well. Mm. Let their blessings cause them to stumble. Wow. Let, verse 10, let their eyes grow blind so they cannot see. Let their backs grow weaker and weaker. Again, quoting Old Testament. What? What? What did David just say? And how often is it the case in our own lives? How often does our bountiful table become a snare? In today's words, how often do our houses and our jobs and our gross income become a snare? How often does it become a trap that because my, my investments are prospering, that this investment is prospering? Because, because I'm receiving worldly blessings, it must be a sign that God has shown favor upon me. This is the part that gets me. Let their blessings cause them to stumble. For me, I, I, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of getting up in front. I, I like talking, and I, I, would, I always think like, oh, well, if I don't like getting up front and I like talking, I could write a book, but I'm horrible at English. Like writing, I hate English. Um, so I'm at a bit of a crossroads, so I just do what's easier to come up front. But how often are our blessings something that causes us to stumble, you know what I mean? Our, 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 even our spiritual blessings, we can misuse almost anything that is given to us and substitute it for what God has really just blessed us with. Blessing is just a whole other idea of grace. It's, it's crazy. Um, let me share a, a quote from you, and it's, it's from a song, so bear with me. It's one of my favorite songs, actually, but there's this, this quote from this song called In the Words of Satan, and the whole song is basically based around what Satan tells us and tries the lies that he tries to feed us. Um, so the song says, in Satan's words, and this is crazy because this is, again, just describing exactly how I felt. I'll make you think you've got spirituality when it's really just emotional alchemy. Now, for those who, of you who aren't chemist, chemistry whizzes, and I'm not, um, I just knew because I was in chemistry at the time. Alchemy is when you take a metal and you chemically change it so that the surface is something else. Often in, in olden times, people would take a ball of uh, iron or something, I don't, any, any, any metal, I guess you could do it if you do it properly, but they would dip it into another chemical that would react and make the surface turn to gold. And so what that would do is that would earn them a lot of money <laughs> because nobody then was like, oh, this is alchemy. Let me test this metal and see, you know what I mean? So it's this idea of, of basically what I was doing, I was, I was covering up all of the spiritual confusion and pain by saying, God has done this in the past, God has, you know. I was waiting for God to speak to my heart and I was turning a heart of stone into, I was trying to turn a heart of stone into a heart of gold by making excuses. I was making golden excuses, I guess, and just, and I was like, oh, it looks great, so I was like, um, So, yeah, crazy idea that, that this, this comfort could be a complete facade and it could even lead to our ultimate destruction. Verse 11. Did... God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery. Now, what I've been saying so far is kind of depressing. 
because, well, and quite frankly, it was impressive when I was going through a lot of this stuff because I was like, God, what are you doing? Why is my life like slowly crumbling? Why are all these pillars and all these things, these these statues that I've built up myself to be, why are they all crumbling down now of all times? Um, and I wondered, God, why are you causing this to happen? And I relate to this this beginning of this verse so well. It says, did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Did I Have I committed the unpardonable sin? Dwight Nelson was talking at 3 a.m. this morning. So many things to this sermon have happened like within the last two days that it's insane. And I like it, but I don't like it because I like to be prepared. And the Holy Spirit was like, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. I'll tell you this morning in Sabbath school. I'll tell you while you're sitting down there. Anyway. <coughs> Dwight Nelson was talking about the unpardonable sin. He says, these people will come to him in his church or wherever. They'll get a hold of him and be like, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. You have to help me. I don't know how I'm going to earn salvation or whatever. You know what I mean? Nuances. For the sake, we'll say that they have no honest intentions. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know how I'm going to be saved. I've committed. I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. Help me. And... It's a bit of an oxymoron when you think that you've committed the unpardonable sin. Because the unpardonable sin would be to neglect the Holy Spirit. Now what the Holy Spirit does is he quickens our consciences. So for you to say, help, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin, you've basically cleared you've cared yourself. You've already, you're no longer suffering if you think you're suffering. Because to, to, to acknowledge that something is going wrong is to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is... is, is doing something in your life, and even if it's you're not acknowledging the Holy Spirit per se, you are acknowledging that something is going wrong. And so, it, it was a bit of a, di a dichotomy because these people think that they're sinking in sin, and in reality they're making a mountain out of, a not, not even enough, out of nothing. They're performing a miracle. Um, but, yeah, it's just a, it's a because Can God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Paul says, of course not. His purpose was to make his salvation available to the Gentiles, and then the Jews would be jealous and want it for themselves. So, this for me says, God's making his salvation available to everyone else, and that's what he was, or that's what I felt like he was doing. He's making it available to everyone else so that I would be jealous and want it back. Because I have, I had felt it prior to that experience. I had felt it before. I knew that what I was feeling wasn't what I should be feeling. And then I took it a step further because this summer I understood that, that God works in ways that we don't even understand. Um, I know you'd think that would be a given, but um, I was realizing that everywhere, everything, God has a purpose. Um, yeah, we'll get there. Okay, so he made it available to the Gentiles so the Jews would be jealous and want it for themselves. So, are we following, you know, the Jews see people as, the Jews, the Jews see Gentiles as people who are, you know, undeserving, blah, blah, blah. God has made it available to the Gentiles so that the Jews will say, hey, what's going on? What's the big deal, God? Why aren't you giving us what you promised us and giving it to someone else? Um, verse 12. Now, if the Gentiles were enriched because the Jews turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world will share when the Jews finally accept it. Thirteen. I am saying all of this especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as an apostle to the Gentiles. I lay great stress on this. Fourteen. For I want you to find a way to make the Jews want what you Gentiles have, and in that way I might save some of them. Fifteen, this is the, the, the scripture this morning. For since the Jews' rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, how much more wonderful their acceptance will be. It will be life as for those who are dead. So, God is, Paul is saying to these people, man, isn't it great that those people rejected God? Because since they did, now you can't accept Him. Does that strike any of you as a little odd that Paul would be rejoicing that God's chosen people rejected him? It struck me odd. Let's continue. 
continue reading. 16. And since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, so their children will also be holy. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be also. Love this metaphor. Okay, the next couple verses we're just going to read and then we'll unpack it. The branches will be too, verse 17. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the Jews, have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branches from a wild olive tree, were grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised to Abraham and his children, sharing in God's rich nourishment of his special olive tree. So... This is where the idea of grace really comes into play because God has chosen a people, Jewish people, and he has seen some broken, he has broken some branches off and grafted us in. Let's continue reading because I'm running out of time apparently. Um, verse 18, but you must be careful not to brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. Huh. Huh. For me, that's a huge thing, because it's so easy for me to say, oh man, I understand this great thing, I understand this thing, or, or look at that person, they're broken off the tree, now I'm in the tree. There must be a reason that they were broken off. I know, it was because so that I, it was because I need to be in the tree. You know, God obviously saw the potential in me, he saw, he knew that I was something special, and he didn't want to be rude, so he just broke them off, and you know put me in there, you know, we, God and I, you know, we have this thing, you know, he doesn't really tell anyone else, but we have an understanding that I'm special, and I need to be in the tree, so he made an exception. I don't think so. I don't think so. Let's continue reading this. Verse 18, but you must be careful not to brag about being grafted into, to replace the branches that were broken off. Remember, you are just a branch, not the root. 19, well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches, the Jews, were broken off because they didn't believe God. And you are there because you do believe. Don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the branches he put there in the first place, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe to those who disobey, but kind to you as you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you also will be cut off. Verse 23, And if the Jews turn from their unbelief, God will graft them back into the tree again. He has the power to do it. Hmm. Amen? Amen? He has the power to do it. This is central. Parents, grandparents, cousins, uncles. You know that family member that you have been praying for. Parents specifically, you know that child that you have been praying for. You know that spouse that you have been praying for. That parent you have been praying for. <coughs> God will and can graft them back into the tree. Granted, Amen. he may not put them right back next to you. But do you trust that he'll put them back into the tree? This has been an issue for me and my family. Because I'm going to be honest with you guys, I have two older brothers who I, and that I pray for almost regularly. When are they going to learn their lesson? When are they going to see that God has been doing all these great things for them their whole life? Well, when am I going to? How long did it take me? What lengths did God have to go to reach me where I was? He's going to do the same thing for them. You're not. We aren't. We aren't. We are so special that we're. We're so special to God that. And it's so crazy because it's not even like we can understand it. We're so special that just as special as we are to God, so is every single person, ever. Just as amazing as your story has been, so is the next person. But not in a way that's, it's special because it's you. I've been, I was talking with one of my friends and, I'm, and I'm packing this idea of grace, like what, what is this? And so. We have this idea of the list or life, list or life. Are we following a list or are we following life? And we, we think that God is, or Jesus, whoever it is, you know, you picture it, you mind walking around, you come up to heaven, and it's not like God is going to say, recite the 23rd song. What's the 7th commandment? 
I don't think God has a pop quiz waiting for you at the gates, you know what I mean? I think God does have a list, though. But there's only got one, there's only one requirement. It's, it's simple, and it's so simple that we don't like it because we want to do something to earn it. Because we need to, we don't like charity handouts. We, we need to know that, hey, I did something. You know, it's a sense of fulfillment. The only thing on God's list, you guys, is are you here? Hmm. Nah. Are you here? The only question we need to ask ourselves when we're doubting whether or not God is really working with us or working with someone else that we want him to be working with is, am I in Christ? Am I seeking daily? Am I knowing that God is going to work out salvation with that person the way they need to have it be worked out. And I love, and we'll wrap up here because I know some of you are probably getting tired and bored of listening to me talk. But, this is what I wanted to capitalize on. This chapter, the last couple verses, I think it's, um, yeah, starting in verse uh, 28. It says, many of the Jews are now enemies of the good news. But this has been to your benefit, for God has given his gifts to you Gentiles. Yet the Jews are still his chosen people because of his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 29, for God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Never. That means no matter if they are smoking, if they're having promiscuous sex, if they're swearing at you, if they're wanting to be separated from the family, if they get a restraining order, if they're dating this person, if they're dating that person who's not an Adventist, if they stop becoming vegetarian, if they they can go to the, sh the, the shadow of the valley of death, because David did. David went there. We've all been there, whether it's physically or spiritually. God is still there. Where... Where have you gone? Where have you searched? Again, going back to Deuteronomy, I have closed your ears. Where have we searched? Where have we been looking that God hasn't been with us that whole time? Where have you, when have you looked to the law for salvation that God hasn't been standing right next to you saying, hey, I'm right here? Where have you searched in, in, in gambling and in, in addiction? Whatever it is, I don't, I don't know. I don't need to. You know what I'm talking about for each of you. And I know what I'm talking about for me. Because let me not deny the fact that I struggle daily as well with sin just as much as the next guy. Where have you gone? How low have you been that God hasn't been the one to pick you back up again? Where, how far from grace have you run that it's not still right behind you? Continuing. 29, for God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Never. Not by anything. Verse 30, once you Gentiles were rebels against God, but when the Jews refused his mercy, God came, God was merciful to you instead. And now, in the same way, the Jews are rebels and God's mercy has come to you. But someday they too will share in God's mercy. For God has imprisoned all people in their own disobedience so he can have mercy on Everyone except the Adventists? Everyone except the Christians? On everyone. On all people. We are all bound to sin the same way as the next guy. And even though it seems like it would be hard to believe that this person does anything wrong ever, they do. Thinking that you'll never do anything wrong in and of itself is doing something wrong. You see how crazy it is? You see the mentality that God has to his people not, not his people in church, not his people doing evangelist work, evangelistic work. Bear with me here. The people who we walk by and don't say hi to, the people who we walk by and say, I would never do that. The people who we walk by and say, why are they dressing that way? Those people are the people that God is working in. Do not be so shallow-minded as to think that God is not with that person. Because I've made that mistake. And I've become that person who I would look at and say, God's not with that person. They're just out there because they because they are they're doing it for show. There's two opposite extremes, folks. There's there's people who are down in the pits 
And there's people who look like they are way up above them, so high that you never even think they would be ever have seen the face. But the two extremes are exactly the same on the inside. They're both empty. We need to find the under, we need to understand that God, God's love is so widely expanded that there is nowhere you can go. You can't run to Buddhism and not be in God's grace. You can't run to atheism and not be in God's grace. It's, it's, it's contradictory for a person who's atheist to say, I don't believe in God and continue loving their neighbor and doing right and being punctual and doing all these things. It's a contradiction because God is love, amen? amen. God is love. Every action of love, every word of kindness is an expression of God's character. Granted, it's finite because we are finite. But it is an expression of his character nonetheless. Continuing on in verse 30 and recapping very much. And now, in the same way, the Jews are rebels. God's mercy has come to you, but someday they too will share in God's mercy. Verse 32, for God has imprisoned all people in their own disobedience, so he could have mercy on how many people? Oh. Everyone, thank you. A few of you are still awake, I'm sorry. 33, <laughs> oh, what, oh what a wonderful God we have. Yeah. Oh what a wonderful God we have. Yeah. Church, yeah. church, do you understand what a wonderful God we have? That he would be with the person that you don't want to be with. And that you, for that reason, should respect them. Because if you're messing with them, you're messing with him. And if they mess with you, they're messing with him too. Which is weird because they're on his side. But, the, but he's also on your side. God's, God is, even me, right? It's, it's so impossible for us to not put a box around God because we can't understand something so infinite. There's this... We'll wrap up and I'll share a quote with you and we'll pray, I promise. Um, what a wonderful God we have. How great are His riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible is it is for us to understand His decisions and His methods. Maybe God, for me, I know I struggle certain things that if I found out someone else struggled with, I'd say, whoa, they struggle with that thing? How is God still working in their life? Someone out there today right now is smoking or having sex or doing something outside of the outside of our preconceived idea of the will of God but is God still working in their life yes, yes. yes God is still working how how can how contradictory is it of us to think that God cannot work with someone who is sitting and think that he's working with us because as we're thinking that we're sinning God is with everyone. How impossible is it for us to understand his decisions and his methods? For who can know what the Lord is thinking? Who knows enough to be his counselor? This is interesting. This word counselor in Greek, that's the internet, in Greek has ne is never used in the Bible except for in this context. It's, it's never used, which is weird because... Then it's like, did Paul make this word up? <laughs> did he make up a word to, because there's no way we can describe counseling God. So Paul probably was just like, put some letters down and they can figure it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's, it's so crazy. It's such a radical idea for them to even think of God being, someone being God's counselor. Who knows enough to be his counselor? Verse 35. And who could ever give him so much that he would have to pay it back. For everything comes from Him. Everything exists by His power and is intended for His glory. Again, that person who's struggling right now today somewhere in the world is struggling because God has a purpose for them to go through that struggle. He's, he may not be making it happen. I don't think God is like... I, I'm pretty sure that God is saying, hey, you're choosing to do this? Okay, I can work with that. Okay, I can work with that. You want to smoke? You want to... And I have such a shallow understanding. Obviously, I've made a reference to smoking people like four times. But you know what I mean? You know, the sins that people do, the things that people do. God has a purpose for each and every one of them. For me, it was thinking that I would do all these things and become and, and, and understand in myself that I'm spiritual now because I, I read my Bible and because I go to the, I pay attention during the sermons, I pay attention during the worships, I, I pray for these people, I say the right things when I pray, I quote verses when I pray, I'm spiritual.
Everything exists by His power and is intended for His glory. Those things, those, those foolish, they're foolish. Those foolish thoughts that my works could save me were intended for me that when I understood them, I would be able to share them with you today. Do you understand that right now the will of God is being worked out as I'm speaking these words? Amen. Is that not insane? Is it not weird to you to think that God is controlling the rhythm of your heartbeat? That God is controlling how much you're getting from me speaking? God is, is so, so intimately involved in our lives that we don't even understand. And this is the quote I want to share with you as we close. This is a quote, I don't know if many of you know Gary Parks, but he came, the guy's a genius, and I'll, he is just wise beyond words. And I'm sure he doesn't think so, but for someone like me, he is. This is a quote, he went through uh, some program, some college somewhere, and he he asked one of his professors as he was graduating, he said, you know, Doc, what's, the, what's it all about? What's the, what's the one bit of knowledge you want me to take away from, from all these years of schooling? And his professor said, don't ever believe anything about God that would make you think less of him. For it is impossible to believe God to be better than he really is. I have a friend who's going to Southern and he wants to take graphic design. But there's a lot of pressure from Bible college that he needs to be there. And obviously Bible college is God's ultimate will for everyone. That was sarcastic. It's not. Um, but now he feels bad because he understands that he, he should be going into graphic design. And he says, can God be that good? Can God? Does God, want, does God really want to let me do what I want to do? Does God want me to be happy and use my gifts for serving Him? Well, when you put it that way, it sounds obvious. Yes. But how often is that the same case for us? Does God really want me to, to have a nice house? Does God really want me to have this job and make a lot of money? Those things aren't wrong. God works in everything, amen? amen. And everything, He has a purpose and He has a will. It's when we stop believing, like it said. The reason the Jews were broken off from the tree is because of their unbelief. Don't become so foolish as to think you've done something to be part of the tree. Because God can quickly remove you. Not to be scary or intimidating. But it's nothing that we've earned. It's a, it's a message of good news that God put us there because He wants us there. So that's the closing thought, I, I think. Don't ever believe anything about God that would make you think less of Him. Because it is, it is impossible for you to think of God better than He really is. Our knowledge of Him, my knowledge of Him, in this small unpacking of Romans 11, I still will never understand everything about Romans, about God's grace, about justification by faith. God can never be fully unpacked, otherwise we wouldn't need Him, because we figure it out by ourselves. God can never be better than we think He is. Amen? Yeah. And neither can His grace or His forgiveness. I want to keep sharing, but I'm, I, I won't. Well, I'll share one thing with okay. Interesting, interesting um, Bible at work here. Quick fact. In, there's, I was listening to Light Bearers. Uh, there can be some of, them, some of the messages, and they have one where it's a panel of the speakers. And what they were talking about, this completion, this, this spiritual relevance of the Old Testament to the New Testament, is uh, in Exodus, you see a list of all the, the 12 tribes. And then you see a list of the 12 tribes later in Revelation. And if you look at the two lists, there's one tribe that's switched out. Dan. Dan is switched out. Now, there's nothing wrong with the name Dan. People named Dan. They're perfectly fine. But if you look at what the name Dan means, in Hebrew, it means judge. Daniel means God is judge. Now, okay, that's great. God is judge has been taken out. What's been put in? Manasseh is the tribe that's put in. If you look at what Manasseh means, it means to forget or to forgive. So we look at this spiritual completion that God has given us. It's, it's, it's woven into everything, folks. Forgiveness is woven into the very fiber of our being. 
That's why we need it to survive. If you hold on a grudge too long, it can physically kill you. <coughs> the completion comes when we understand that judgment is where we were, forgiveness and faith is where we are. That's what the ultimate goal God has for us is. And we see that throughout Romans. God is pounding in this idea that you don't have to do it. You don't have to earn it. Yes, your works will be a result of the faith because you can't keep it inside. I obviously can't. I'm spilling words all over the place. But the works aren't the result or the ultimate goal. The works aren't something to be, I need to do this. If I'm not doing this, then my faith isn't there. Don't ever believe anything about God that would make you think less of Him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, whew, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for loving us and for and for forgiving us. Before, while we were yet sinners, you still loved us. You still sent Christ to die for us. While we were still sinning. Um, yeah, it's just so insane, God, and I hope that someone here would be inspired to continue to, to study this thing out, this this idea of grace, I know I will be, but I ask that someone here would really have heard what you wanted them to hear this morning, that it's okay, you can let your guard down now, God does not have a checklist waiting for you when you arrive, when we arrive, I ask that you would help us to really understand what it means to be justified by faith, um, it's just crazy, God, we thank you for all the work that you're doing in our own lives right now, and all the work that you're doing in the lives of those who we can't even see that you would want anything to do with. But we thank you because you love each and every one of us the same. The way we think you love someone else, that's the way you love us. The way we think you love us, that's the way you love someone else. Um, just be with us now as we, as we live our lives and help us to remember, God, that you're big and you love us and you just want to spend time with us. Help us to do that. Help us to just be able to find rest in you, God. Put all the works, all the things aside, and just be able to really experience who you are in its fullness and just let you fill our hearts and flood our lives with your grace and your forgiveness and we extend it to others. Spirit, I ask that you help us to extend, extend it. It's hard to do that in, in our world today. Not many people are open, not many people are receptive. Our culture has tricked us into thinking that if you have something good, it's got fine print at the bottom. But help us to be able to act in a way that would make people accepting of you and accepting of, of, of your spirit. And so we ask these things, God, that you would bless us and just continue to guide us and keep us, keep our minds focused on your glory and your name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.